everybody, my name is Shortline819 and welcome back to episode 13 of Shortlines Are Owners in Common and today we will be talking about the outcome of the Norfolk Southern proxy vote and why I think Ancora lost and where Norfolk Southern goes from here. So if you haven't been paying attention, a Cleveland-based investment firm by the name of Ancora brought a proxy vote forward to Norfolk Southern. Ancora was basically saying that the current Norfolk Southern management has been abysmal that the Rarit has shifted away from the hardcore precision schedule Rarit and operating principles that brought it financial success in the past, that safety has has slipped on the Rarit, which resulted in the East Palestine derailment, and that by bringing their, uh, by putting them in charge of the Rarit, by bringing the people they want, Norfolk Southern would be returned to glory. So they brought forward this proxy vote, and they wanted to unseat current NSCEO Alan Shaw and replace him with a person by the name of Jim Barber, who was a former chief uh, operating officer at UPS Ground. And they also wanted to bring in as chief operating officer, Jamie Boychuk, who was chief operating officer at CSX during the Harrison era and later under Jim Foote, but who was recently fired. They also wanted to put on the board seven of their own people, Norfolk Southern Board is 13, and they wanted to put on 7. And if you want to think of this in terms of wins or losses, Ancora definitely lost. Norfolk Southern won but with a couple of asterisks attached to that, which we'll get to later in the video. Now, Ancora was successful in getting three of their board members onto the Norfolk Southern Board. Uh, Gil Lampier, uh, Sarah Family, and William Clyburn Jr., the CEO slot was fairly interesting. Current CEO Alan Shaw won, uh, while I do not hold Norfolk Southern stock, members of my family do, and they came to me with a suggestion on who to vote for, and I suggested to vote for the current NS management. So this is not an unbiased video in the slightest. Now, I did make a video. I did make a video earlier, before the night of the proxy vote, having some things to keep in mind going into the proxy vote. And one of those things is that the majority of Norfolk Southern stock is owned by institutional investment firms, not owned by individuals. And I was basically suggesting that these institutional investment firms, they were the ones who were ultimately going to be deciding this, and they did. So most of these institutional investment firms actually voted against, uh, against Ancora, while most of the individual people the individual shareholders who are typically more swayed by Wall Street, they voted for Ancora. There was also the passive and the active investors. The passive investors, the people who generally sit on the stock long term, voted against Ancora. Well, the people who actively buy and sell, you know, the stock, Wall Street day traders, voted for Ancora. But Ancora, they had they had a plan for Norfolk Southern. And what part of the reason why I think they lost is a lot of these inactive investors and these institutional investors simply looked at this plan, said this is all fine and good, but it is completely unrealistic and we have no confidence in your ability to pull it off. So their plan involved getting Norfolk Southern's operating ratio down, currently at 70%, and they wanted to get it down to 55%. And this was through somewhat of a, somewhat of a, some parts of the plan were detailed, a lot of other parts of the plan were very vague, and a lot of the parts of the plan were very questionable. One of the most questionable things about it, in my opinion, is that this relied, plan relied on soliciting a whole bunch of new merchandise traffic, where if you look at what a lot of shippers thought of Ancora and their plan to bring back PSR to NS, they were saying, we are going to ditch the railroad if, if this happens. So how are you going to bring back merchandise traffic if you can't even keep the customers that you currently have? There was also... Ancora said that they wouldn't, they wanted to have reductions in labor, but they wouldn't do this through layoffs, right? Through outright, outright layoffs. They would do this through attrition, which, was, considering their financial targets and what they wanted to reach, seemed quite dubious and simply a bit unrealistic. Now, they also came out with a safety paper in the wake of a three train pileup up on the Lehigh line a couple of weeks ago where they demonstrated a, a basic failure to understand how railroad safety equipment actually works, which meant that all of their posturing about how we're going to make the railroad much safer to prevent another East Palestine, it, it made it seem hollow and, and, and empty. And there's, of course, also their CEO selection. They wanted Jim Barber, former 
uh, chief operating officer of UPS Ground to come in and run the railroad. And Jim Barber had several comments specifically about labor and how to manage labor on, on, on railroads that were quite questionable. And Chairman Oberman now, now retired as of today, as of today I'm recording this, which is the 11th of, uh, the 11th of May, 2024. Barber had several comments about where he basically failed to understand how rail labor actually works. And he, he basically said that furloughing people and calling them back later is sort of equivalent to seasonal hiring like what they do at UPS. And that's simply incorrect for several reasons. First is that, well, seasonal hiring, seasonal demand at, say, a uh, package shipping company is generally a lot more predictable. You might have individual spikes throughout certain points of the year, but generally you're always going to be a lot more busy around the holidays and a lot more busy around certain parts of the year, while railroad demand is very, very volatile. It can go up and down, up and down on a dime. Also the fact that compared to at least a lot of jobs at UPS, not all, but a lot, railroad jobs are very, very highly specialized, right? It become, it takes six months um, to just learn how to base, to drive a train. I'm an engineer even longer to become a conductor if you're a maintenance worker if you to become an experienced maintenance worker it takes around that time too and unless you're anticipating this demand you know several months in advance which is unless you have a crystal ball basically you're always going to be behind the curve and of course there's the fact that that you are an engineer and you you train for six months and you work for two months and what happens you're furloughed then and the company comes back six months later and says oh yeah we need you to come back are you really going to come back how many people are going to come back at that point it's just it's just not an equivalency that transfers from from the package shipping industry over to railroading and it, it's just that demonstrated basic failure how how that works uh, i'd also like to point out that the selection of jim barber itself was almost sort of baffling for the simple reason that Encora's plan relied on doing redoing norfolk southern's operations from the ground up like Boychuk said he wanted to take it all down to the studs and re rebuild it. But if you're doing that, if that's your main goal, in in my mind, you would want to bring in a, a very experienced railroading operating person. Someone like, I don't know, Hunter Harrison. Or you know who? You know who would make sense? Jim Vina. Jim Vina would make sense. Why didn't they put up him? But it, it, it's sort of interesting. In my mind, you would you would want someone like that. Instead of someone who, yes, while he does have operating experience, it's from a completely different sort of industry. So that aspect was also quite baffling. So all of these assets, all these factors sort of came together. And the, the institutional investors, I, I think, they looked at this at Encore and their plan and, and a lot of the statements that they made and, and basically said, yeah, we don't, we don't trust your ability to actually run this railroad, right? And, well, Encora in there, they had a statement. And this is probably one of the most asinine things I've ever heard from an investment firm. This is more, this is more appropriate for politics than it is for, for this, albeit this is a politics of a sort. So after, the, after Encora basically lost, they came out with this statement. So they said at the meeting, quote, if anything should go wrong here, and there's another derailment and people die, this is on you. They're talking to the, the passive investors and the institutional investors. Quote, you ignore the recommendations of the proxy advisors, the unions, the largest customer of the company. You literally gave us no support, and we still won three board seats without you. What happens to Norfolk Southern is now on your firms and your conscience. Basically preemptively blaming people who didn't vote for them for another East Palestine if it were to happen. Of course, Encora sort of stretched the truth in this regard. Only some proxy advisors recommended that shareholders vote for Encora. Others did not. Some unions threw their support behind Encora. Some did not. Although that situation is, is, is very, very interesting. And if you are a member of a union who supported Encora, please let me know below. Because I am very, very curious to see what you think. And uh, to continue with the massive cope... Uh, I don't really know any other way to describe it. The Ancora said investors sent a loud and clear message to replace the company's unqualified CEO and reconsider its ineffective strategy. 
which has driven industry-worst customer delivery times, severe derailments, and persistent share price underperformance. Notably, CEO Alan Shaw received what we deem a resounding vote of no confidence based on preliminary voting results that indicate he barely received support from 50% of the company's outstanding shares. Hello everybody, Future Editing Shortline here, and originally this was sort of a long-winded segment talking about those asterisks that I mentioned at the beginning of the video. However, information that has come out since I recorded that video has caused me to come back and modify it. So, when I recorded the video, preliminary results indicated that Shaw won just over 50% of the vote for the CEO slot. It has since come out that he has actually won 65% of the vote. Now, that does give him a lot more breathing room than I had initially thought. You know, if that 50%, just over 50% vote remained, that really didn't give him a whole lot of breathing room to execute his plan, and I thought there would be a good chance that within a couple of months, if he didn't deliver financial results, that he'd be out of the CEO slot anyway. So now he does actually have more breathing room to actually execute his plan. It also makes a statement by Ancora that they made at the time saying that, you know, even though we lost, uh, it was a resounding vote of no confidence in Shaw. More ridiculous. Although in context of, you know, the time that they were making that, it makes a bit more sense. Still a bit nonsensical from my end. The second asterisk was... You know, because Ancora managed to get three board members and because, you know, Norfolk Southern had to hire John Orr away from CPKC, those who were wishing for a full expulsion of Precision Schedule Rare and Kermenes would be disappointed. I still mostly stand by that. Elements of PSR will probably remain at NS. However, it has since come out in a Railway Age article that the board members that were elected due to Ancora, Ancora's candidates, they weren't exactly fully on board with Ancora's plan. They really didn't like how Ancora executed the campaign. So between these two things, Ancora has definitely lost more than we had initially thought, which is, and this is where I'm getting into my opinion, which I think is a very good thing for the rarid industry. So that's my, that's my little button later on, uh, back to the main. It's going to be very interesting to see how Norfolk Southern and, you know, how this all plays out within the next coming months and years. Norfolk Southern really hasn't had that much of a good time the past couple of years. Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious to say. But, um, yes, well, thank you all for watching, and, uh, please comment down below. Uh, what do you think? What did I get wrong? I, I, I'm far more wrong than I am right, so I'm bound to get something wrong. Please tell me below. Comments are the best part about these videos. And I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye, everybody.